The ancient people of Jesus' day had two basic fears. They, uh, they feared disease and they feared evil spirits. And the reason that they feared those two things is because basically they felt like they had no control either over either one of those things. You know, they did have doctors back then and they did have people back then that said they could control those two uh, things, the evil spirits, but they really couldn't. Not to a very good degree. You know, back then, a simple cold could turn into pneumonia. It could then lead to death. A, a cut on the leg could become an infection and could lead to death. And they really did think back then, the ancients uh, of the first century believed that, that the, the atmosphere itself was just filled with evil spirits waiting to wreak havoc upon your life. Uh, you stubbed your toe, that was an evil spirit that did that to you. Had a bad day at work, that was an evil spirit. So part of what was going on there for people in their everyday life was there was a real fear uh, that gripped them each and every day of their lives. I imagine, if you will, just every day of your life wondering if an evil spirit or a disease of, or sickness would somehow enter your life and cause you to experience the difficulties that we've just described. It was kind of a dark world, if you would. But then imagine hearing that there was a man who with just a word could tell a demon to leave. Imagine hearing news that there was a man who could place his hands on a sick person and the sickness would immediately leave. That's exactly what happened in the first century. And his name was Jesus. We're continuing to preach through the book of Luke. And this morning's sermon is titled, He Would Heal Them. And it's based upon Luke's gospel, the fourth chapter, verses 31 through 44. You know, if you've got your Bibles, you'll need to turn to that passage of scripture. Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 31 through 44. Again, no PowerPoint this morning. It's just straight preaching. There's no real learning points here for us today. I just want you to focus on what the passage of scripture has to say. And previously, we've seen how Jesus has come to this people, and he has announced to them, Hey, I've come here to preach good news to the poor. I've come here proclaiming that I am here to release the captives, to set them free. I've come to announce the, that this is the year of God's favor. And now we see him beginning his earthly ministry there in Galilee, and he begins to do these very things. And this is tremendous hope for these people, this idea that now for the first time in generations, there is hope that they don't have to live each and every day in fear, that an evil spirit is somehow going to take control of them, that just a simple accident might lead to death. Somehow, some way, there's a possibility, a small glimmer of hope now that they could be taken care of through this man named Jesus. Now, that's difficult for us to bring in our day and time today because of the circumstances here. So we're, we're going to try and do that here in just a few moments. But let's look at the passage of Scripture first and then try and bring it into our own day and time here today. So it's Luke's Gospel, the fourth chapter. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 31 and read through verse 44. It says, Then he went to, down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because his message had authority. In a synagogue, there was a man with an unclean demonic spirit who cried out with a loud voice, Leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. And throwing him down before them, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. They were all struck with amazement and kept saying to one another, What is this message? For he commands the unclean spirits with authority and power, and they come out. And news about him began to go out to every place in the vicinity. After he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up immediately and began to serve them. 
When the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he would heal them. Also, demons were coming out of many, shouting and saying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. When it was day, he went out and made his way to a deserted place. But the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. You know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, the the issue for us today is the fact that we today are not really challenged by these circumstances as they were back then. Hey, you get a cold, you just go see the doctor, right? I mean, you get the medication, right? Even if it's a little bit serious, I mean, we go to the right doctors and they prescribe the right medication or we go through the right procedures and we get it taken care of. And folks, I'm just going to speak from a very practical standpoint here. As far as I know, in my 58 years... I have never run into someone that was truly demon-possessed. Now, there were some that I thought maybe could have been, uh, but to my knowledge, I've just not really run into somebody like that. And I'm not saying, maybe you have, but I'm just really trying to bring this into practical terms here for us to read this passage of Scripture and take away something from it today where we can use it in our everyday lives. I'm just saying that I don't know that I've run into someone yet who was demon-possessed. Maybe you have, but I think by and large, most of us in here probably are in the same situation. So the issue here is, what do we do with this passage of Scripture? How does it apply to us today as we look at it and look at it for ways? in which Jesus impacts our lives today. And I think that that what we have to do here is we have to let this passage of Scripture speak to us in the very simple ways as it presents itself to to us today. And I think the simple way of allowing it to speak to us today is to let it do this, to say simply that Jesus, who loves us and died for us, stands here today As the same Jesus as he stood back then, ready to set us free from the things that possess us today and to heal us from the things that make us sick today. Amen? He's the same Jesus. He loves us and has compassion for us just like he loved and had compassion for those people back then. And he wants to set us free from those things that possess us and control us today. And he also wants to heal us from those things that make us sick. Now, I recognize that there may be some people here today that say, yeah, Brother Robbie, I think that's probably the thrust of that message. But here's the issue, Brother Robbie. I I really don't feel sick and don't feel like I'm possessed of anything today. So it may be a good message today, but I don't know that it applies to me. And if that's where you're at, I understand that. That's fine. But I would just ask you this morning, just for the next 20, 30 minutes, if you would, please just have an open mind. In fact, right now, I would just ask you just real quickly, just to say a real quick prayer to the Lord Jesus. Just say right now, Lord Jesus, keep my mind and my heart open to your word here for the, for the next few moments. You see, it's very easy for us to convince ourselves that we're not sick, that we're not possessed, when in fact there may be some things that we are simply avoiding. We're going to look at these three episodes in which Jesus does something very dramatic, miraculous, And it's all driven by his compassion and his love for people. Something that he has for you and for me as well. This first instance has to do with demon possession. And again, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen today. And I'm not trying to swerve scripture away from its true meaning. But I am simply saying that we want to observe what Jesus does with regards to this individual and how he deals with this issue. And what we see here is that in this situation, he causes the demon to leave by his authority. That's what I want you to see here. Look at verse 32, and then we're going to look at verse 36. In verse 32, it says, The people were astonished at his teaching because his message had authority. Now look at that phrase there, his message had authority. Everybody see that? Nod your head like this, okay? You see it. His message had authority. That's that's important because now we're going to go to verse 36. Because by verse 36, Jesus has already encountered this individual who has the demon. And he has caused the demon to leave. All right, He's exercised the demon. And in verse 36, this is what the people say. They were all struck with amazement and they kept saying to one another, What is this message? 
For he commands the unclean spirits with authority and power, and they came out. Folks, don't miss this. Jesus caused the demon to leave by his message, and it was a message of authority. In other words, and just bear with me, he didn't cut up a chicken and use the entrails in some kind of voodoo ceremony, okay? Jesus spoke the word, and the spirit or the demon left the individual. It was just by his spoken word. These people were used to these individuals who claimed to have some kind of control over evil spirits and did some kind of weird kind of ritual. Jesus just said, demon, leave him, and it happened. And they were in awe of that. And they said, what is this message? It has power and it has authority. Now listen, folks, that's exactly what Jesus does in our lives today. When it comes to those things that possess us today. What is it that has possessed you today? I'm not talking about an evil spirit or a demon. But you know there are things that do possess us today. What is it that is in you that is producing an unhealthy behavior? What is it that is within you that drives you and is causing you to do those things that you know probably are not what you should be doing? What is it that has possessed you today? Is it worry? You know, Jesus has a message about worry. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 34, he says, Don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What is Jesus' message about worry? Don't worry. Now, I know those of us who are possessed by worry, we say, well, that's just, that's just who I am, and, and that's, part of, that's part of how I work things out is I worry about them. And that's, that's how I make sure that I, I get everything done is I worry about those things. I understand that, but Jesus has a message about it. He says, don't do it. There's a better way. What is it that's possessed you this morning? Is it an unforgiving attitude towards people? There's some of us here today that have had things that have happened to them a long time ago. Some people have hurt your feelings. And it happened a long time ago, but you've not forgotten about it. As a matter of fact, you've kind of got that cataloged in your mind. You remember every slight and everything that's hurt your feelings. And that has possessed you. Not only has it possessed you, but it has shaped your personality. There's a reason why you avoid people and there's a reason why you don't trust people. Like you should. Because you can't forgive anymore. The pain and the heartache that people have caused you down through the years has possessed you to the degree where you don't want to have interaction with people anymore because you don't want to be hurt again. And not only that, you can't forgive those who have hurt you in the past. But you know, Jesus has a message about that. Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 15, Jesus says, But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. That's his message about that. Now, I want to make sure you heard that message. Jesus said, Hey, do you want to be forgiven? Well, I think all of us do, don't we? He said, Well, it's important that you forgive others if you want. To be forgiven yourself. What is it that has possessed you this morning? Is it a critical spirit? Is that what has possessed you as an individual? Are you the person that says to everyone else around you, this is how you do it. Wait a minute, you've made a mistake here. Don't do it like that. Are you the person that has that critical spirit that wherever you go, you're telling people how to do it, why to do it, where to do it, what to do? When they make a mistake, you're the first one to jump in and say, hey, you did that wrong. Do you possess a critical spirit? 
Oh, listen, I know what the excuse, I know what the response is. You're saying, listen, I'm just trying to help people. I'm, I'm just trying to help people do things better. Listen, you've told yourself that lie for so long, you even believe it. You're not trying to help people. This is what's happened. You've been hurt and hurt badly. And somewhere down, way down the road, a long time ago, you've experienced shame and disappointment. And you are critical of other people because that helps you feel better about yourself. So when you can criticize them, that makes you feel better about yourself. That's what's happening. And Jesus has a message about a critical spirit. He says, first take the log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's his message about a critical spirit. And I want to make sure we all understand what that really means. He doesn't say, okay, so get busy, get all that stuff out of your eye, and then be critical about everybody else. Then you have permission to be critical about everybody else. He's not saying that. He's saying, don't worry about other people's issues. Worry about your own and, and forget about everybody else. You see, folks, there are things that possess us today. And, and these are just a few things. We could talk about greed. We could talk about hatred or anger. We could talk about a fixation on other people or our family to the degree where it's unhealthy. Jesus has a message for all those kinds of things. Now listen, I recognize that maybe you're here today and you said, yes, I, I realize I've had some things that possess me and drive me. And I've even tried to change those kinds of things, but I've not been successful. I realize that I have an issue with those things, but I just haven't been successful. I've tried to change them myself and I've failed and I understand why. Because those are things that only Jesus Christ can change in your life. And the way that they change is by not only hearing the message of Christ, but coming under the authority of Christ. Remember, this demon was exercised by the message of Christ. Christ and his authority. Listen, those things will only change in your life when you come under the authority of Christ. You know, one of my favorite shows is uh, The Andy Griffith Show. I don't get to watch it nearly as much as I like, but I like The Andy Griffith Show. Don't y'all like The Andy Griffith Show? You know, and, and one of the reasons why The Andy Griffith Show works is it's a funny show, but it's also based in reality to a certain degree. You know, and just take, just take Barney, okay? He's a, he's a deputy sheriff in a small town, okay? And Barney, he just doesn't look like a deputy sheriff. I mean, let's, let's back up a little bit. He's got the shoes shined, right? He's got the uniform. He's got the belt with the gun. I mean, there's no bullets in the gun. The bullet's in his pocket. But he's got the belt. He's got the, he's got the tie and the tie clip. He's got the hat. I mean, he is dressed as a deputy sheriff, but he's skinny as a rail, he's short, bug-eyed, and he's just goofy, right? <laughs> but by and large, now correct me if I'm wrong, by and large in Mayberry, most everybody does what Barney tells them to do, right? I mean, there are exceptions, but by and large, they do what he tells them to do. Why? Because of the badge, right? Because he's a deputy sheriff. And then you've got Andy, right? Big, strapping, handsome Andy. Why, he doesn't wear the uniform, but just about halfway, right? He, he, he doesn't have the tie on, right? It's just open collar. He doesn't have the shiny shoes. He's got, he's got boots on, right? Have you ever noticed that? Doesn't, he doesn't have a gun on. But everybody in Mayberry respects Andy, right? Why? Doesn't have a gun, doesn't have the tie, doesn't look like a sheriff. But he is the sheriff. It's because his position holds authority. Now, I am not in any way comparing Jesus Christ to Andy or Barney Fife. <laughs> what was that? Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but I am saying that with authority comes power. And the Bible tells us 
There is no one in a higher place of authority than Jesus Christ. He is at the right hand of the Father. And at the right hand of the Father, that means that He has all power, He has all authority. Now here's what we, in our limited minds, think. We think that nobody has more power and authority in our lives than ourselves. And that is a total falsehood and a lie from the pit of hell. There is one who has more authority and more power in our lives and over our lives than ourselves, and that is Jesus Christ, if we'll simply, simply surrender our lives to Him. So for us to be free of those things that possess us, we need not only hear the message that Jesus Christ gives us, but we must submit ourselves to His authority. Now here's the problem. In the story, we see it instantaneous. The demon is gone. For us to place ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ, His transformation of us is a day-to-day -day basis kind of thing. On a regular day-to-day -day basis, we place ourselves under the authority of Christ and let Him slowly but surely make that transformation in our lives. Here's the bottom line. I believe that if Jesus can take a demon out of a man in the first century then he can surely set me free from the things that possess me today. Amen. Now there's another episode here. Jesus goes and stays at the house of Simon Peter and his mother-in-law has a fever. She's sick. And they ask Jesus about that. And he says, I'll see to it. And so look at verse 39. What happens in verse, verse 39? Well, he rebukes the fever. Look at verse 39. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up immediately and began to serve them. Now the word rebuke is a strong word. It means to admonish, to charge. It really means to scold. In other words, to fuss. That's what it means. To, to reprimand. So in this instance, Jesus got rid of this sickness by scolding it, by rebuking it. By reprimanding it. Now listen, folks, everybody comes into this world sick. Everyone comes into this world with a sickness. You see, there comes a time when we all come to the place in our lives where we know what's right and what's wrong. And every person makes this same mistake. We know what's right and we know what's wrong, and inevitably, at some point in time, we will choose what is wrong. And when that happens, we become what the Bible calls sinners. And when we become sinners, we become spiritually sick, each and every one of us. There is no one who has escaped this sickness. We are all spiritually sick because of sin. And we know that it is a sickness because the Bible tells us that sin destroys, it causes decay. And sin inevitably leads to death. And that's what sickness does. Now, here's what the world tells you about this. When, when we as, as regular people, when we get to that place in our lives, when we begin to choose those things that are wrong, the world tells us, hey, that doesn't mean that you're sick. That just means you're different. And the world tells you, look... You don't have to worry about the fact that you're different because the world has preached this idea of tolerance for so long that it's become ingrained in the way people think. So the world tells you, listen, there's no right or wrong anymore. There's no, everything's just relative. There's no right, there's no standard of right and wrong. So listen, everybody's just different. This is what the world tells you. Everybody's just different and we just have to get along with everybody's differences. So if you're different in some kind of way, you just find a bunch of other people that are different like you and you hang out with those people and you find enough people that are different like you and, and, and what that does is that just kind of soothes the symptoms of what's different about you and it makes you feel better and then you can live your life like that. That's what the world tells you to do. Let me just make it very clear. There is a difference between soothing the symptom and healing the disease. Amen? The Bible makes it very clear there is a moral standard. There is right and wrong. And this idea that sin can somehow, in our warped way of thinking, be made acceptable simply by getting enough people together in one group saying that it's okay is ridiculous. Sin is sin. 
Now, here's the issue. You and I, we can't do anything about the sin in our lives as far as healing the sin. Only Jesus Christ can heal the sin that's in our lives. Only He has the power to do it. How did He do it? Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross for our sins. Through His death and His burial and His resurrection, He paid the price for our sins. You know, in a simple kind of way, we can say that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, He rebuked the power of sin and death. And to say it in an even more simple way, when you and I come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we accept Him and make Him Lord of all, we say we will follow you, Jesus, from this day forward. And we surrender all to Him. He takes up residence in our lives. And to a certain degree, what He has done is He has said, as far as Robbie Pay from now on, and as far as sin is concerned, sin, I rebuke you. Death, I rebuke you. You have no more place in His life. And that happens in your life as well. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, then the ramifications and the consequences of sin and death, Jesus has said, I rebuke them on your behalf. In this instance, Jesus went to Peter's mother-in-law. And he said to the fever, you've got to go. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, with the consequence of sin and death, he says to both of them on your behalf, sin, death, you've got to go. Then there's one final episode. It says when the sun was setting, they started bringing all these people to Jesus. Now you see this was happening on the Sabbath. So they couldn't bring people to Jesus earlier because you couldn't carry people, you couldn't walk a great distance, that would have been working and it would have been a sin. So when the sun sets, the Sabbath is over. So now they can walk and carry people, okay? So that's what it says when the sun was setting, that's when they were bringing all these people with different illnesses. And when they bring, brought them, Jesus began to heal them, demons were exercised. I want you to look at verse 40. It says, when the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him, and here it is, as he laid his hands on each one of them, he would heal them. The disease is removed, how? By his touch. He just touched them. He touched them, and they were healed. Are you hurting this morning? I know that's a silly question to ask a crowd of old people, isn't it? <laughs> We're old. We're all hurting, aren't we? It's a knee. It's an elbow. It's a... We, none of it, we don't know what it's like not to hurt when we get up in the morning, do we? But I'm not talking about that kind of hurt. Are you one of the walking wounded among us here today? Are you hurting because there's conflict in your family? Are you hurting today because of the loss of a family member? Maybe you are hurting today because of an illness or disease. It's not so much the physical pain as much as it is the diagnosis and what it means. And I want to be very careful here. But maybe you're here today and you're hurting because of something that happened a long time ago. Somebody took advantage of you. Did something to you that they shouldn't have done. And you've held on to that pain for a long time. So much so that it's become a part of who you are. You know, you've lived with it for so long. You've, uh, you've found ways to cope with it. It's so much a part of you now that uh, the idea of letting go of it, something that you don't think about much anymore. 
But the fact is, is that it's still there and it's still influencing you. It's possible that you've given up hope ever being set free from that pain and that hurt. I want you to know that Jesus loves you and he knows what that hurt is. He knows what it's like to be hurt. And he knows what to do with pain. And he wants you to give you he wants you to give him that that pain. And it's okay to let go of it and to give it to him. And I want to make a promise to you that if you'll give him that pain that you've got, if you'll give him the shame and the humiliation that it's caused you, he'll take it and he'll take it away. And he'll replace the shame and the humiliation with something good and something beautiful if you'll just let him. It's an old poem. You've heard it before, but it fits. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it was hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid? Good people, he cried, who'll start the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar, do I hear two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no, from the room far back, a gray-bearded man came forward and picked up the bow, wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings. He played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. And the music ceased. And the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What now am I bid for this old violin as he held it aloft with a bow? One thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. And the audience cheered, but some of them cried, We just don't understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply. Well, it was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised with sin, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. And I believe that what that poem speaks of can be reality in a person's life if we'll simply let the master touch our lives as he did these so many long ago. He can heal the hurts that we all have. He can take away that which possesses us. He can remove the consequence of sin and death if we'll simply come under his authority and allow him to take possession of our lives. Now you'll notice at the end of this passage of scripture the people said, hey Jesus, don't go. It said there in verse 42, But the crowds were searching for him, and they came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. They said, Hey, Jesus, you've got a good thing here. You've touched many lives. You've saved a lot of people. You've made a huge difference here. Please don't go anywhere. Stay right here with us. But Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. You see, he wasn't satisfied for those he had touched. There were more that he needed to see about. And the same is true today. Jesus has touched many lives today to this point. For 2,000 years, 
Jesus has been impacting lives. And we could say, Jesus, you've done enough. You've saved enough. You've healed enough. But no, Jesus is here right now. And he won't be satisfied until you turn your life over to him. That's why he's here today. He won't be satisfied until you surrender yourself to him. And let him touch you. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, please. This is your time here to respond to God's Word and His presence with us here today. If God is speaking to you here this morning, we're simply giving you an opportunity to respond to what He has said to you here today. And our prayer is this morning that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you'll come forward and say, I need Jesus. I need Him to forgive me of my sin, to heal me of my spiritual sickness. To take away the pain and the heartache that's in my heart and in my life. Maybe you're already a believer and you've simply allowed the things that have happened in your life to keep you from being a follower, keep you from doing the things that you know Christ wants you to be and do. We encourage you to rededicate yourself to Christ, to, to begin living a life that truly is pleasing to Him. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer, but you're not a member of a church and you need to be involved in God's family and God has said this is where you need to be. And so you want to join this church. Perhaps you need to come to this altar and simply pray a prayer of confession of sin or ask the Lord to help you for whatever is going on in your life. Don't miss this opportunity. I know Jesus is here. I know he loves us. I know he wants to minister to you here today. So won't you respond to him through?